At the beginning of Lecture 11 in this series on Chinese paintings of gardens, I announced that it would be the first of two on that subject, and that the second would be devoted entirely to paintings of gardens and of a scholar's rock by two late Ming masters who had played big roles in my career of scholarship and writing, that is, Wu Bin and Zhang Hong. And I announced that the second lecture on garden paintings would also consider, quote, the pictorial consequences of the injection of a new idea into late Ming painting, an idea probably aroused by the Chinese artist's exposure to foreign European pictorial art. What if, instead of simply following traditional Chinese practice, we were to compose a picture from a single vantage point and depict the things in it as seen from that particular angle? And much of the lecture will be devoted to considering the consequences of that revolutionary idea, end quote. That was me speaking. In saying that, I set up a program for myself that will be hard to follow, or it would be if I were to stick to it. But I've decided not to do that, and, uh, but to, do, uh, to simply present the garden paintings by the two artists and the rock painting by one of them, leaving a full treatment of other works by the two of them for a later lecture, or maybe two, after I've been able to assemble more images. So here we go. First image, please. I begin the visuals of this lecture with photos, which I've shown before, of my great teacher, Edward Schaefer, on the left, and my great, great friend and colleague, and also teacher, and that I learned a lot from him, Joseph Levinson, uh, as patron saints for the methodology and direction of some of the arguments that I'm going to use. One of Schaefer's best-known books, as many of you know, is The Golden Peaches of Samarkand, about elements of Tang material culture and other culture that were adopted from the West, Samarkand being a place uh, uh, in what was for them the far West. But Schaefer also, in his course on the bibliography of Chinese studies, brought out the achievements of scholars who worked on cross-cultural transfers of materials and ideas. From Joe Levinson, I learned, among other things, to take, to take a highly skeptical view of those great Chinese myths of insularity, by which little except Buddhism uh, in their culture was recognized as coming from outside, outside China, that is. Uh, I should emphasize immediately to avoid charges of Orientalism from followers of Edward Said, that I've always stressed also the importance of what the West learned from China. As Schaefer did, I once accompanied him to a lunch lecture he gave for a medieval studies group on the UC campus, um, a talk titled, China Invented the Middle Ages, in which he outlined those major, in fact, crucial elements of medieval Europe's technology and culture that had come from China, uh, starting with the compass, the stirrup that permitted mounted knights in armor and so opened a new age of warfare, and then gunpowder that ended it, uh, later printing and so forth. Well, next please. The first grand get-together of Chinese painting people, apart from the post-mortem symposium that I myself organized after the Chinese Art Treasures Exhibition in October of 1962, and you're going to find that soon, the document about that on my website, uh, the first grand get-together was the International Symposium on Chinese Painting, held at the Palace Museum in Taiwan in June of 1970. Here you see a group of the participants who had booked their flights together, meeting at the San Francisco airport before making the Trans-Pacific flight. From left to right, they are William Wu or Bill Wu, two women whose names I don't remember. One of them is a New York dealer, Max Lohr, a Chinese woman artist, whose name I also forget, I'm afraid, Dick Barnhart, looking very young and scarcely recognizable here, the collector John Crawford, Susan Bush, myself, and Zhu Jing Li. Next. The publication that came out two years later with the papers from that symposium, the Proceedings, seen here, was for a long time one of our basic texts for Chinese painting studies. I don't suppose many young scholars pay attention to it today. I can tell lots of stories about that, such as how we all had to give up a promised free day to pay a ceremonial visit to the president's residence in Taipei, outside Taipei, to drink warm orange soda pop and wait until the Generalissimo, Chiang Kai-shek, 
came tottering in and greeting us all briefly with a Madame, Madame Zhang, Zhang holding, his, holding him up. But the two papers that concern us for this lecture are the two last papers in this volume. Next. One by Michael Sullivan. I don't have a photo of him from that period, only this more recent one. His paper was titled, Some Possible Sources of European Influence in Late Ming and Early Qing Painting in which he identified pictorial materials that are recorded as having been brought to China by Jesuit missionaries in that period, mostly engraved illustrations to Christian texts, but also topographical works. Um, this was a move in his long engagement with interactions between China and the West, leading up to his major 1998 publication, The Meeting of Eastern and Western Art. Michael was good enough to let me read the paper well in advance of the symposium. Uh, we were by then close colleagues at Stanford and Berkeley, and I, so to speak, ran with it. Next. In my own paper on Wu Bin and his landscape paintings. I won't try to summarize that. I'll have another lecture treating Wu Bin's works, but I'll only mention that it was greeted by Chinese scholars in the audience, generally, with wonderment that, this, uh, that a foreigner could be taken seriously an artist that they had never paid any attention to. And disbelief in the idea that Chinese artists were adopting important pictorial ideas from European art. They hated that idea. Or if it was true, it must be true only, as one young respondent suggested, of a minor master like Wu Bin. He was minor because, well, anyway, there it was. Next. I, meanwhile, used Michael's identifications of prints that the Chinese could have seen by late Ming to put beside passages from Wu Bin's paintings, such as this detail from an album leaf in the Palace Museum, um, which I put beside one of the European prints, Christ Healing the Leper, from Nadal's Life of Christ, to show how Wu Bin had, I suggested, learned how to draw the, a hill that could be ascended visually along a path or a road that zigzags up the front face. Next. Or this hill from a later Wu Bin hand scroll in the Honolulu Academy, similarly constructed, uh, so that it can be ascended along its front face, although no longer by a zigzag here. Next. Later I would produce a great many such comparisons in various writings, especially in the first chapter of my compelling image on Zhang Hung, uh, that displayed the adoptions from the West by Chinese artists so unmistakably that others had no choice but to accept them, or at least some of them. Next. I'll show only a single example of Wu Bin's later landscapes, this one known to me only from the reproduction in a recent auction catalog, but obviously a fine and genuine work by him. As an example of the kind of monumental landscape that Wu Bin was later to paint, inspired by the monumental landscapes uh, of northern Song masters that he was able to see in Nanjing, where he worked, and uh, in other collections elsewhere. This will be a main subject in my future Wu Bin lecture. Suffice it to say now that he brings back to Chinese landscape painting qualities that it had lacked for many centuries, such as effects of deep space, of atmospheric eroding volumetric forms, of surfaces one can traverse visually. I owned two fine Wu Bin landscapes myself during my long years as a collector. Both are now whereabouts unknown. Next. For the purpose of this lecture, I'll show only two works by Wu Bin. One is a long hand scroll depicting the Shao Garden belonging to Wu Bin's important patron, Mi Wan Zhong. It has long disappeared as a garden, but the few remnants can be identified on the site, which is now on the campus of Beida or Peking University, where Huang Xiao studies. Huang Xiao was seen here with his wife Liu Shanshan. As I related in the previous lecture, these two are collaborating with me on a book on Chinese paintings of gardens, in which Wu Bin's hand scroll will appear. The scroll was owned by Huang Gao Wang, part of the collection he inherited, as I recounted in the previous lecture, from his ancestor Wang Tung Ho. Uh, and Wang Go has, repeat, has reportedly presented it to the library at Peking University so that it can be at the place where the garden itself was located, and so that it can also be together with a similar scroll by Wu Bin's patron, Mi Wan Zhong, 
uh, of which I'll show a section as we go along. Now let's look finally at, my, at the images of, of Wu Bin's hand scroll. Here is the opening section. It's painted in ink and colors on paper and is about uh, five meters long. The artist's inscription is seen in the upper right. Uh, it contains the title Spring Party at the Shao Garden and a cyclical date corresponding to 1615. This scroll, I should say, was prominently featured in a 1968 exhibition at China House in New York titled Gardens in Chinese Art, organized by its owner, Wang Go Wang. In general, the composition uh, follows the hand scroll type shown in previous lectures uh, in which the viewer is made to enter the garden visually through a gate at one end and then is shown the outer limit of the garden at the other end. We enter through the gate at far right, that is, make our winding way along a path that follows the edge of a pond with leafy and flowering trees on both sides. We join another visitor, a man with a cane, about to pass through a second gate. Moving through that gate, where a donkey stands, we pass a group of donkeys on which some of the guests have arrived. One of the donkeys has crossed the path to drink from the pond. Next. The path continues downward and over a steeply arched bridge with two guests crossing it. A boat loaded with guests is seen on the pond below. Someone could count all the figures in this scroll and get some idea of how many how many uh, people Mi Wan Zhong entertained at his spring party. He was a rich and powerful man, as the artist emphasizes by the multitude of figures he shows in the garden. Next. And here is the bridge with a willow tree at one end. Most of you know, I hope, that the Chinese were master bridge builders, achieving feats that astounded the rest of the world and left them far behind, as in so many other technical matters. There's probably a volume or part of one on bridge construction in Joseph Needham's Science and Civilization of China series. Next. And here is the boat, pulled by two boatmen, with seven guests and two servants supplying them with food and drink. Wu Bin makes no attempt to distinguish the figures of the guests beyond changing the colors of their robes. Their hats expressing official rank are all the same. This is not a series of portraits in a landscape. I could show you one of those probably by Wu Bin at another time. The next. The third section of Wu Bin's scroll. I should emphasize again, as I did in the previous lecture, that I do not pretend to be a trained specialist in Chinese gardens and I can only describe what we see in the images with, to use a favorite phrase of Archibald Wenley, the Freer Gallery's director, with the eye of the naked observer. Arch Wenley used to say, while he was looking at a work of art, to the eye of the naked observer, this would appear to be dot, 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 <laughs> and we curators would all laugh for the umpteenth time he used his jokes over and over. Well, um, to get back to Wu Bin's painting, we pass through still another larger gate and cross the canal by a covered bridge. Next. Here is the gate closer up, with one guest standing inside it looking out at another. Two cranes are in the fenced enclosure below. Note the construction of the wall, with flat stone set into the base to strengthen it against wear. I use this feature in a hand scroll by Shunjo, with two misunderstandings of it in copies of this scroll, to distinguish original from copies in my lecture on authenticity and dating at the end of our first series. Next. In this fourth section, we see the rows of leafy trees continue and the two canals or waterways with another lake between them and a semi-island with an open pavilion on it. The sheer amount of water that must have been required to feed and sustain all these lakes and canals in the Shao Garden was an engineering feat in itself but one that a high official like Mi Wan Zhong could easily afford. I should mention that Hung Ye, or William Hung, who as I remember taught at Harvard, wrote a long study of Mi Wan Zhong's estate and its present condition, published in 1966. I can't give you a full bibliographical citation, but I think it was one of the Harvard Yenching series of publications. I used to own it. Next. With section five of the scroll, we arrive at what I would take to be the central section of the scroll, the large open hall in upper right with the broad terrace in front of it uh, and connected to other buildings by covered corridors. 
is probably the main entrance to Mi Wanzhong's house, and he may be one of the figures seated at the table just inside. This is also the section of the copy of Wu Bin Scroll by Mi Wanzhong himself that was on view when I, when I visited the Beida Library in 1973 and photographed it and reproduced that photograph in my Distant Mountains book. Next, please. As seen here, in this image copied from my book, this, in other words, is a section of Mi Wanzhong's copy of Wu Bin Scroll. I don't have my old slide available for a color picture, but it would, wouldn't reveal very much anyway. Mi Wanzhong made a coast copy of Wu Bin Scroll two years later, in 1617. His copy, painted on silk, is also in the Beida Library, which now owns both scrolls. Why Mi Wanzhong would take the trouble to copy Wu Bin Scroll meticulously, I have no idea. He was a painter himself, mostly a landscapist, and a much lesser figure than Wu, although much better known. And I gave him a brief treatment in my uh, Distant Mountains book. Next. This detail of Wu Bin's painting allows us to see the entryway more clearly. If I were to guess at which figure is Mi Wanzhong, I would choose the one with a red coat, but that's only a guess. On the terrace outside is a fine taihu shir, or ornamental rock. Uh, Mi Wanzhong collected these, a rich man's hobby like collecting antique cars or precious stones. And we'll see other larger ones later in the scroll. And we'll see a notable smaller one, a table rock, that he acquired in 1610 and had Wu Bin portray later in this lecture. Next. This second detail shows us the stepping stones, or rather the stepping roots, that visitors and guests had to use to cross the pond at this point. It was part of the garden designer's art to construct the garden so as to slow down users of it, compel them to take their time while making their way through it, so they could better appreciate the visual and other sensory delights that were prepared for them. Next. And here is the third detail from this central section, showing the group of four guests seated around a stone table beneath trees on the foreground island, with a servant bringing them more to drink on a tray. When we dream of being back in those days, enjoying such pleasures, we need to remember that it was a time of high political tension and instability, as outlined in my compelling image book and in countless better sources, with a dynasty that was nearing collapse, we should remember also that as members of the 99% corresponding to China's non-elite, not all-male, uh, non-classical scholar class who made up the vast majority of the population, we would most likely end up as one of the servants who served the guests. But it's also worth remembering always, to be fair, that the Chinese system of officialdom, with all its faults, was one that in principle allowed a man of lowly descent to rise through education and exam success into official rank. The Ming artist Tong Yin was one who almost made it that way. But in practice, very few did. Next. Section six takes us out of the central area of the garden toward its fringes. The two inner waterways end, while the big one that surrounds the garden appears again. And we see a two-story pavilion on its verge with people inside. More ornamental rocks are seen on an island in the distance. A dense bamboo grove fills the space behind the two-story pavilion. And when we look closer into it, next please, we make out two men seated at a stone table set up over the winding stream, an artificial stream that seemed to suggest the cup-floating scene of the Lan Ting gathering. They are drinking and talking. The lower, leafless parts of the distant bamboo grove allow transparency, and it's through them that we see the figures. Wu Bin manages such visual subtleties as he paints. Inside the two-story open pavilion overlooking the water are a number of guests, some gazing outward, some conversing with each other. The building is set on a stone base with grass growing around it and green spots on the water standing for lotus or water lily pads. But the biggest spectacles of the garden are still to come. Next. These are the massive decorative rocks set up on the edge of the canal, forming a rockery that must have been a major spectacle within the garden. I have no idea whether these rocks have survived on the site. They may have. 
An archway through which visitors can pass penetrates the rockery, with pointed forms like stalactites hanging down inside to increase the sense of walking through a cave. I remember walking through such caves and rockeries in Suzhou Gardens, especially the Scherzelin or the Lion Grove Garden. Next. The detail shows the quasi-cave closer up with some vegetation growing around it. Wu Bin shapes the rocks and textures their surfaces, much as he would do for rocks in one of his landscape paintings. The rockery was intended to provide the experience of seeming to be transported to a rocky landscape. Notice how he has treated the ripples on the water unevenly, for instance around the flock of swimming ducks in upper right. Next. In the upper left of this section is a semicircular terrace with a stone, stone railing and two men stand on it gazing outward, attended by a boy servant. Leafy trees surround them, like the ones in the opening part of the scroll. We sense that we have reached the outer limit of the Shao Garden and we're about to exit it. Next. And so it proves as we roll on and reach the end of the scroll with the collector's seal in the lower left. The two men on the terrace are gazing out into the outer world, which is very different from the enclosed ones that they occupy. Three horsemen are riding along a road here, accompanied by two luggage bearers, approaching an arched bridge, a thoroughly practical one, very different from the elegantly constructed and narrower one near the entrance to Miwan Jung's garden. Ordinary houses and an open building that may be a restaurant are seen above at right, and what looks like irrigated fields for growing rice or vegetables across the canal. Even the banks seem plainer, weedier, untended. We have reached the end of Wu Bin's pictorial presentation of the Shao Garden and moved outside it into the real world. Next. Next, we are going to look at the most remarkable of all works by Wu Bin, a hand scroll that he painted for Mi Wanjong in 1610 portraying an especially fine and unusual scholar's rock or table rock that Mi had just acquired. And most unusually for the late Ming, or any other time, Wu Bin, it was presumably he who made the decision, decided to depict the rock as seen from ten different angles or viewpoints. It's as if you turn it and make ten photographs and use those as the basis for penetratingly realistic paintings. But of course, there were no photographs in the late Ming China, only this artist, and another whom we'll see, Zhang Hung, who decided enough of brushwork and style and old styles and a fixed vantage point and all the rest, all that stuff that we've inherited from our oppressively weighty tradition. I think I'll just throw that all over and paint what I see as I turn this rock and see it from 10 different angles. And Wu Bin went ahead and did that, and it, as it had never been done before, and it was never, to my knowledge, to be done again. Next. Wu Bin's hand scroll was owned by a private collector in Shanghai, and it had been exhibited on loan in the Shanghai Museum, which expected to acquire it as a gift. But the owner somehow got it out of China to the U.S. This was back in the 1980s, when it wasn't so easy to do things like that and it was put into auction at Sotheby's New York on December 6, 1989. It was number 39 in, the, in that auction, and it brought the staggering price of $1,210,000, which set a record for up to that time. Nobody knew who acquired it. It was bought by the New York dealer Hans Frankel, who ordinarily didn't handle Chinese paintings, bought for some unidentified customer. I still have no idea where it is now. But fortunately, I made a set of slides of the images of the rock, and we'll show those, along with images from the auction catalog that include Mi Jung's inscriptions, as my images don't. The catalog informs me that the painting is about 55 centimeters, centimeters in height, more than half a meter, and nearly 10 meters in length. Now, while I show these images, I'm not going to talk. I really have nothing to say except over and over, look. Here is the same rock seen from another angle. So to avoid that, I will play instead another piece from Ravel's Tombeau de Couperin, the minuet recorded for me by my daughter Sarah for use in this series. 
Another piece, as most of you know, from the same suite, the Forlan, is the music used for our introduction and closing credits. Please understand that Sarah recorded this informally and did not edit it as she would have a recording for commercial release. So here we go, seeing Mi Wan Jung's newly acquired rock as painted by Wu Bin in 1610 from 10 different angles and listening to Ravel's minuet from Le Tombeau de Couperin as played 401 years later by Sarah Cahill in 2011, together for the first time and quite possibly the last. I hope you enjoyed that unusual combination of Wu Bin and Ravel, as I did. So here I am back talking and pointing out that on the last rock in his series, Wu Bin has inscribed his signature, very small, in an oval cartouche, as if engraved on the inside surface of the rock, reading Wu Bin Xie, meaning Wu Bin sketched this. After producing that incredible series of 10 almost photographic images of this rock, he has the nerve to write, Wu Bin sketched this, using the word xie, which is usually used for quick sketches. Next. I bring back these photographs of my Berkeley colleagues, Michael Baxendahl and Svetlana Alpers, to remind myself to tell how, after this amazing hand scroll and Zhang Hung's Jur Garden album that we'll see next, had come to light and I was writing about them, I showed the images of them to these two major authorities on European painting and described what the two late Ming masters had done, adding that both were known from other evidence in their works to have been heavily affected by their exposure to European pictures that were in China at that time. And I asked them, can you think of anything in European art of that time or earlier that they might have seen and that could have inspired these projects? Both of them listened and looked carefully but in the end shook their heads, no, nothing like these pictorial projects had been done to their knowledge by any European artists. So the mysteries remain. Next, please. And here is another photograph, this one of a dinner, or maybe breakfast at, at our Berkeley house when Xing Yuan and I were living there, showing myself and four good friends, Howard and Marianne Rogers, with Joseph and Hiroko McDermott. Hiroko is an art historian, but it's Joe I want to speak of. He's an historian of Mingqing, China, with a more than casual engagement with Chinese art. 
He's been for years teaching at Cambridge University in England. Anyway, toward the beginning of my article on Zhang Hong's Jur Garden album, which we're coming to, I credit Joe for uh, discovering an important, hitherto unnoticed source of information on Zhang Hong, a notice on him in the local history of the county where he lived, west of Suzhou, near the Taihu or Great Lake. I will cite that notice in just a bit. I, wanted, I want to introduce Zhang Hung first with a few of his paintings. Next. Here to begin with are two leaves from an album of landscapes and old styles that he painted in 1636. Uh, the album was once my own, and I've published leaves from it in various books and catalogs. These two leaves are in the manners of Nizan on the left and Xiao Gui on the right. Nearly all albums of this kind contain leaves in the Nizan manner, which was easy to do. Hardly any have leaves in the Xiao Gui manner, which was decidedly not easy to do, and which was hardly practiced at all after the Song, as I've related in various lectures. And Zhang Hong has understood and mastered Xiao Gui's way of painting well enough to reproduce it in this leaf, and presumably to use it also in his other works. Next, please. If I bring back this section from near the end of Xiao Gui's pure and remote view hand scroll, it will make this clear. Zhang Hong has understood Xiao Gui's methods of constructing masses and spaces, the flat top form with trees on it, the river receding behind the bridge with bushes seen through fog, the volumetric treatment of the nearer bluff above, and the reduction of further wind to silhouettes, and so forth. Uh, Zhang Hung may have seen the original of this great work, or only a copy, but he recaptures more of its basic style and method than much of anyone else of later China, at least anyone known to me. Next. <clears throat> the principal painting that I chose to represent him in my chapter, uh, my compelling image first chapter, and to set against Dong Chi Chang's Qinglian Mountains picture, that should by now, by now be familiar to you, uh, is Zhang Hong's Forest Dwellings at Zhu Chu, which he painted in 1650. The painting had recently been purchased by the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, so those who attended my lectures could see it on exhibition nearby. We also borrow the Dung Chi Chang painting from the Cleveland Museum, which had recently acquired that. I presented Zhang Hong's painting as a landscape not constructed but contemplated, and my argument in these first two chapters, to put it briefly, is that Zhang Hung, by defying the rules that have been laid down by prestigious critics for what was the right and wrong ways to paint, established himself as an artist who was doing the wrong thing for his time, if one wanted to become rich and famous. While Dong Chi Chang, great opportunist that he was, besides being a great artist, managed to do the right thing and to dominate his age. Next. Zhang Hung's inscription on his painting, seen here, relates how he painted it while staying with a friend whose house overlooked this mountain. Every day, he writes, he gazed out over the mountain scenery while seated at his desk. And he implies without quite spelling it out, what he saw is what we see in his painting. Next, please. And there we have, in essence, what Zhang Hong's painting is about. He paints what he sees. In another inscription that I'll cite later, he tells how he visited a certain place and discovered that it didn't look like what he had expected, what he had heard about it. Really, he says, reading about a place isn't the same as seeing it for yourself. For us who are used to stories about landscapists who climbed the Swiss Alps or went to Yosemite to paint what they saw, this won't seem surprising. But in China, it was a strange thing to say, or at least to say and then carry out in one's paintings. And Zhang Hung's reward, Chinese connoisseurship being what it was, was to be marginalized, declared an artist of the lowly competent class, Nung Pin, virtually forgotten, like Wu Bin, until a contrary-minded Westerner who lacked the proper appreciation for the Chinese literati value system brought him to prominence. Next, please. In my compelling image chapter, I discuss and reproduce several leaves from an album of 10 scenes of Yue, that Zhang Hong painted after making a trip to the old Yue region in eastern Zhejiang. Uh, the inscription he wrote on the last leaf ends, about half of the things I saw there did not agree with what I had heard. So when I returned home, I got out some silk and used it to depict what I had seen. Because 
relying on your ears is not as good as relying on your eyes, which is another way of saying, don't believe everything you read or hear, just believe your own eyes. And that too may sound commonplace to us, but it was revolutionary for a late Ming painter to write. Next please. And I go on to show how he had used his eyes not only to look at the real scenery of Yue, but also to look at some of the European prints that were to be seen in China at this time. And I match them up, one of them at right, for instance, with the view of Herbs Compensis from the Brown and Hogenberg compilation Civitatis Orbis Terrarum, or Cities of the World. I needn't point out how closely these correspond. The bridge going back diagonally narrows as it recedes. The church steeples sticking up from the cityscape in the European picture become pagodas in Zhang Hung's Chinese one. Juxtapositions of this kind used in my lectures made even the most skeptical give in and accept the fact that Ming Cheng artists had adopted important new pictorial uh, ideas from these European pictures, which they didn't want to admit. Well, almost everybody, Casey Zhang or Zhang Guangzhou, the eminent early China specialist at Harvard, told me after my lecture that he could not accept my proposal until I presented evidence. And it turned out when I questioned him that he meant written evidence. Visual or pictorial evidence didn't suffice for confirmed book readers, even when it's as compelling as here. Next, near the beginning of my last chapter of my compelling image book, I reproduce and discuss briefly the hand scroll that Zhang Hung painted in 1625 representing Wang Wei's account of his ascent of the Huazhe Hill. Reading this opening section from the right, we see Wang Wei's dwelling among the trees and the gate from which he comes to begin his night ascent. Then a path winding up the sloping hill marks his climb. Such a form, which one can visually climb, so to speak, up its front face, was not to be seen earlier in China. Zhang Hong, like Wu Bin, had probably seen and learned it from, next please, this picture that I showed before, or something like it, the scene of Christ healing the leper from Nadal's Life of Christ, with a hill in the distance that provides a model, its front surface climbable along an ascending road. Next. I will have another lecture on Zhang Hong, if I hold up long enough, and show some of his notable works in good color images. This, copied from the compelling image black and white reproductions, suggests inadequately the remarkable character of a landscape that he painted in 1625, with much of it reduced to flecks of ink and color. Ha ha, proto-impressionism again. Next. This photo of the dealer Walter Hochstetter I've shown in several previous lectures, usually or always to make the same point, that he had the bad habit of breaking up works of art that he acquired and selling parts of them to different buyers. I won't go into the painful story of how he separated Zhang Hung's Jur Garden album in this way, how the 20 leaves traded hands over the years. At one point, I myself owned six of them, including the last one with Zhang Hung's inscription on it. I received these from Walter in one of our trades in exchange for paintings that I owned and he wanted. I sold them, my six leaves, years ago to LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum, so they could, with other acquisitions, have 12 of the leaves. Eight more are now in the Museum for Ostasiatische Kunst in Berlin, so the album is now divided between only two collections instead of four or five as it was before. The whole album was brought together for an exhibition in 1996 at LACMA. Next, please. Unfortunately, by bad judgment, the Berlin Museum had mounted their leaves in the Japanese-style album form, so that only one could be shown at a time. All the leaves stuck together, that is, not easily separable as they can be in the Chinese system. I wrote their director to complain about that, and I received a polite reply that can be summarized as, mind your own business. The pamphlet published by Lakma to accompany the exhibition, which you see here, with all the leaves reproduced and with essays by their curator, June Lee and myself, was printed in too few copies and is long out of print. If you can find a copy, buy it. Meanwhile, this lecture will present all the leaves of the album in good color images with some details. Next. The leaves of Zhang's album are not numbered, 
but the bird's eye view is logically the first. Zhang Hung has inscribed on it, complete view of the Jur Garden, along with his signature and seal. The question immediately arises, where was this garden? And who was the owner for whom Zhang Hung painted it? These were questions without answers for quite a few years. I asked garden specialists, including a famous one in Shanghai, without getting an answer. Then, in 2010, a young architecture student named Huang Xiao at Beida, Peking University, wrote me an email, helped by his wife Liu Shanshan, who has better English than he has, telling me that he and his professor, Zhao Chun, had discovered who the owner of the garden was, a copy of this person's collected literary works with a Jur Garden record included in them, was in the Peking Library in a single surviving copy. Later, Huang Xiao wrote that he had not only located the original site of the Jur Garden, but visited it to find the place entirely covered by a busy shopping mall. I will omit all that, which will be related in Huang's part of the book on Chinese paintings of gardens that we are working on together, which should be published soon. Next. Painting a complete view of a garden, what we would call a bird's eye view, was not a new idea. This is one from a garden album by Zhang Hong's contemporary Chen Gu. But conventional pictures of this kind showed the things in the garden, buildings, trees, rocks, and so on, all spread out schematically, all seen from straight on in the traditional Chinese way. So the resulting view is part picture, part map. Zhang Hong does not follow this convention. He seems clearly to have been inspired instead by, next please, by European pictures, and especially this one, the view of Frankfurt from Brown and Hogenberg's Civitatis Orbis Terrarum, uh, Cities of the World. The correspondence is so close that I have reproduced this leaf alongside Zhang's opening leaf whenever I published it. The whole angled view stretching upward from the nearest point in lower left to the far distance in the upper right correspond closely as do the various details that I needn't point out. You can see them for yourselves. Chong Hung is the kind of artist who can draw productively on things that he sees without being squeamish over whether it's a foreign picture outside his native tradition. Next. And that's not all. After studying the leaves of this album for a long time, all this was before I could arrange them neatly on a computer screen uh, in digitized images and move them around at will, I was still moving color slides physically around on a slide viewer and looking at them through a loop lens, I came eventually to realize another truly remarkable thing about the album, that this bird's eye view contains enough detail that one can locate in it, uh, with some searching, the materials of all the other 19 leaves, or maybe all but one, but certain of the, all but one anyway. Moreover, Zhang Hung paints the remaining 19 leaves in such a way that buildings or rocks or trees that are seen in one leaf will appear in another, as seen from a different angle. It's as if he had gone around the Jur Garden with a camera loaded with a 20 exposure color roll and taken pictures that could be visually interrelated to chart out the whole of the whole plan of the garden. Or as if, to use another analogy, as if he had gone around with a rectangular frame, looked through it, and painted accurately whatever he saw through it. Next, please. Now I introduce another real person to tell another story. In this photo, taken in 1981 in the apartment of a noted Chinese restaurateur, William Wu, or Bill Wu, whom we saw, saw earlier in an airport photo, Bill Wu is now at the right end of the row of standing figures at the back. I'm at the left end. I won't identify the other people in the picture, although some of them are quite eminent people. Uh, Bill Wu was a Princeton PhD who became, through my introduction, the first director of the Chinese Culture Center in San Francisco. Later he taught at Mills College, he worked as a tour guide to China, and he died relatively young some years ago. Anyway, I gave a lecture on Chinese garden paintings in 1980 for a symposium at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, and I showed and talked about the Jur Garden album and my new discoveries about it. And the next morning, Bill phoned me to say, Jim, 
I've decided that Zhang Hung doesn't really understand the Chinese garden. What he meant, I later learned when I talked with him, and I later I had him speak for my Chinese garden painting seminar. What he meant was that Zhang Hung didn't paint the scenes of the garden in the conventional way, focusing each one on a particular named and designated scene with an inscription telling what it was, as uh, artists normally did and as you were supposed to do. If the Jur Garden had such designated scenes, as it probably did, that is the such and such pavilion, the such and such pond or rockery or whatever, uh, Zhang Hung pays no attention to these, but he simply shows us what he saw through his imaginary picture frame. That's why he p uh, painted a highly unconventional garden album, and in Bill Wu's thinking, he didn't understand the Chinese garden. Next. The LACMA staff, Los Angeles County Museum of Art staff, accommodated my wishes by producing, on the basis of sketches and marked photos that I sent them, this diagram overlay of the bird's eye view, showing for each of the other 19 leaves the point from which it's viewed and the angle of view, and more or less what's included in the view. As we show the leaves of the album and what follows, my collaborator will do something like that, going back to the bird's eye view, drawing details of it out, and so forth. All that intricate manipulation of images that he does so expertly and so imaginatively. So with all that as preface, here we go on our tour of the Jur Garden as presented for us by Zhang Hung. Uh, a warning, by the way, I've changed my mind on the location of some of these places, so uh, the diagram no longer exact, uh, works exactly. And let me say again that the leaves are not numbered, and the order in which I showed them is one that I've arrived at by imagining this kind of movement around the garden, looking in different directions, seeing the same things in one view that we saw before in another. Next. Now, the leaves in order. Uh, leaf one is just what I, is what I, of course, call the bird's eye view. Leaf two also bears a title, and the artist seals in the upper right corner. It draws us closer to the main entrance to the garden, as it was seen in the lower right corner of the bird's eye view. Um, looking over the dike with willow trees, on which figures are now visible, we see the wall of the garden with two gates, at left and right. Before, I took these both to be gates of the Jura Garden, but now I suspect that the right one, with a piece of wall projecting out into the canal, is the gate to an adjoining garden or property owned by someone else. Next. The wall, as you see here, is built of solid stones, not of mud with a stone reinforced base, as in the more common walls we've seen. I would assume that this kind is more expensive. Uh, we see it uh, in several of the other leaves uh, representing the outer wall of the Jura Garden. Next. Near us on the water is a boat with three people in it a man and his servant, and a boatman with his oar. Uh, this is the way people moved around in this region, a region that was interlaced with canals. Next. Looking more closely at the gate to the Jur Garden, we see a figure with a hat standing in the entryway with a boy's servant. The upper story is empty. A larger boat, the houseboat type, is approaching the steps that lead up to the gate from the water. We can assume that it's going to moor there, and someone will disembark to enter the garden. Already, we see how Zhang Hong paints his scenes, giving up so-called good brushwork altogether, and adapting his way of laying on the ink and colors sensitively to the things that he is depicting. Next. In leaf three, we have moved over the wall, and we gaze down across the tops of the tall, leafy trees that grow just inside it to where a path from the gate crosses a plank bridge with a red railing. A low stone wall parallels it. In the lower right is a gatehouse, uh, visible in the bird's eye view, but now seen to be occupied by two men. Groves of tall bamboo grow on the shore of the pond and the waterway that stretches upward to the right. Well, that's what I wrote about this leaf earlier. Now I'm inclined to see it as probably representing the margin of the Jura Garden, which is on the left, and the adjoining property of someone else on the right. The continuation of the stone wall, the path inside it, inside the Jura Garden, that is. The bridges all belong to our proper subject. 
The tall bamboo in the buildings at the right belong to the property next door, so I now believe. Next. The people in the small house seen in this detail are not then the master of the Jur Garden and his guest, as I said before, but people from that other property. Next. And the dense groves of tall bamboo and the empty house seen further on also belong to that other property. Zhang Hong's purpose of painting what he can see from a certain vantage point extends to this, including things and places that he can see that are properly outside the Jur Garden, but within his range of vision. Next. To the left of this passage in the bird's eye view are two large ponds, each with an open pavilion on the far shore. Ji Chung in his garden essay advises that about three parts in ten of the area of a garden should be given to ponds. Leaf 4 presents the first of these ponds, taking care to include at right, smaller now, the bridge, the low wall, and the bamboo groves from the previous leaf. Each leaf tends to include something from previous one and so forth, as I've said. A tall rockery appears behind the far building, uh, a small rocky island with a tingza or kiosk is on the, in the lower left. A roofed promenade or gallery lined with willows in upper left separates this pond from the next. Next, please. This detail of the building on the far shore shows us a single figure robed in white standing at the red railing and gazing out. His boy servant is in the right corner. Uh, this building is reached by a bridge from the path that we saw in the previous leaf, the path uh, from the uh, gate to the garden. Uh, it passes through that, uh, this building then uh, before making its way on from the main entrance of the garden into the rest of the garden. Notice how Zhang Hung distinguishes the tree types by different trunk and branch patterns, different kinds of dotting for foliage. He has learned this partly from Sung paintings, done at a time when making such uh, visual distinctions mattered, and artists were not just giving us the conventional sign for trees. Notice the large rockery looming above the trees, behind them. We'll see that in another leaf from another angle. Next. Here is the nearer detail showing the islet, the little island with a small tingza on it, and a solitary fisherman in his boat. I don't need to point out, I hope, the sensitive treatment of the water surface, ripples responding to their nearness to the shore, and other masses that break the surface. Next, please. In leaf five, the same gallery is seen in the upper left, but from the opposite side now. We are now located at the far end of the second pond, looking back across it. In fact, we must be situated either in or just above the pavilion overlooking this pond. The two-level terrace with stone balustrade onto which the pavilion opens, clearly depicted in the bird's eye view, is at the bottom of the picture, just within our range of vision. And the top of one of the two gate buildings that appeared in Leif Two, as well as in the bird's eye view, is now visible in the distance, above the willows and the leafy trees that line the pond, along with the roof of another building seen in the bird's eye view. We begin now to realize the complexity but also the logic of Zhang Hung's project. What he sees from any vantage point is what he portrays, or that at least is the impression that his paintings convey, and the relative absence from them of familiar type forms and compositional conventions encourages us to believe that we are really seeing the garden more or less as it was through his eyes. Next. In this detail, we see close-ups of the outer edge of the terrace and its railing at the bottom, perhaps we should imagine ourselves or Zhang Hung on the second story of this building, uh, looking down out of the terrace below us. Next. The boat closer up with a principal figure in red, the owner of the garden maybe, and two others, and the patient boatman. Now let me use a device I've used several times before. Imagine yourself, brush in hand, and ink and colors before you, Imagine drawing those ripples over the whole surface. Keep them changing constantly in tone, in spacing, and closeness, and overlapping. Not easy, right? Requires a constant application of sheer creativity, never letting up. How much easier it would be to slip into the convention for ripples on the water and let it cover the whole surface. Now we begin to appreciate the genius of Zhang Hung. 
and understand why he was marginalized and neglected in the brushwork dominated literati culture of China. He was doing the wrong thing for them, but a profoundly right thing, I think, for us. Next. In upper left, the covered walkway or gallery seen in the upper left of the previous view, now seen from the other side. And groves of willows and flowering trees, the season is spring on the far shore. I'm not clear about locating this, this bit in the bird's eye view, and I leave it for future garden researchers. I believe there are structures on the wall marking the outer limit of this garden along the canal. Next. For leaf six, we are above and slightly behind the pavilion that overlooks the first pond, looking down between it at left and the large rockery that was dimly seen over it in leaf four. If we pay close attention to the rockery, unfortunately I don't have a detail side of it, and especially to the intricate openings that penetrate it and reveal its inner structure, we may sense some affinity between this and Wu Bin's rock that we saw earlier. We saw from 10 different angles earlier. I don't mean that Wu and Zhang knew each other or saw each other's paintings. Wu, uh, Wu Bin's period of activity was generally earlier, uh, but only that they both represent brilliantly new possibilities in painting that were opening up in late Bing China and being explored by these two amazing artists. Returning to the sleeve, the host and a guest appear again, seated at a table beside a cobblestone path that leads into a tunnel in the rockery and will emerge onto a terrace above, on which we can see two barrel seats set there. A two-story ga or belvedere in the lower right of this leaf faces onto a smaller pond clogged with lotus or water lilies. Next. That pond and the open horizontal building beyond it are the subjects of leaf seven, which reveals also two women in a boat, presumably picking lotus roots or water chestnuts. For the first time, apart from the bird's eye view, the top of a pagoda is seen above. It will reappear in later leaves. Now, if we imagine ourselves standing on the broad terrace overlooking the water in this leaf, with an opening in its red railing, next please, leaf eight locates us on that terrace, looking back in the opposite direction, seeing the two-story belvedere and the rockery beyond it, now from a different direction. Do all your viewers begin to comprehend what I mean when I say that we could virtually reconstruct the entire garden if we had the space and the materials and the time and the energy from what Zhang Hong tells us about it visually. And when I say that this is incomparably the best evidence we have for the real appearance, not just the conventional name features, of a great garden from the greatest period of the Chinese garden. I've been saying that for many years. And how many Chinese garden specialists have paid attention? None. Zilch. So I do this lecture full of hopes for the future. Look, you guys, it's almost as if you were miraculously transported back to the late Ming with your cameras and, oh well, no use. But I go on trying. Next, please. The scene of Leaf 9 is not so easily locatable, but proves to be nearby. Without changing position, still situated above the same building, we now look leftward over what appears to be a latticed greenhouse and a bridge across the canal that bisects the garden. Next. Uh, to another two-story gate, the main entrance into the left or further section of the garden. To the right of this, above it in the bird's eye view, is a clump of tall deciduous trees, and under them a thatched pavilion that evidently overlooks another pond beyond the boundaries of this leaf. Next. The two-story gate close up, closer up. Notice that Zhang Hong has cheated a bit, or changed his mind perhaps. He draws the right side of the two-story gate building as a blank shape projecting out from it. Perhaps he began to depict it in a different way and changed his mind. In European painting, pentimenti, or changes in plan, are a recognized feature of great paintings. And we have to allow a Chinese artist, at least one of Zhang Hong's caliber, the same freedom. Next. For leaf 10, we have moved rightward, or upward in terms of the bird's eye view, 
and are looking over this same pond. Lining it at right are many thin trees, uniform in height, with leafage sprouting only at their tops. These appear at the outermost edge of the garden in the bird's eye view, to the left of the pagoda. In the upper left of this leaf is another gallery, or covered walkway, that no doubt allows connection with other leaves that I can't bring out. Next, please. The pagoda, seen in the upper right of the bird's eye view, and in the distance in leaf 7, is portrayed clearly at last, in this one, leaf 11, surmounting a rocky knoll. Below it to the right, drawn simply in the bird's eye view, and now in more detail, is a stone lantern. In the lower right are buildings that are hidden by trees in the bird's eye view. Next. It's a three-story pagoda with the ground floor open and with a red fence inside to keep casual visitors from penetrating farther, maybe. I can't say why this fence is there, but if Zhang Hung portrays it, it was there. Next. In the lower right of this leaf, an old man walking with a cane comes through the gate, followed by his boy servant. The figures are, of course, an exception to what I say about everything he paints really being there. He had to insert some conventional figures in showing the garden in different ways, just as a landscapist inserts figures called staffage to people his scenery. Next. Leaf 12 is another that's difficult to situate within the bird's eye view, but it must portray an area of rocks and leafy trees just beyond its limits in the upper right. The pagoda appears dimly at the top. A servant is seen kneeling inside a roofed porch, waiting for guests while another approaches below. The rock walls seen in the lower section of this leaf are similar to the walls seen before as marking the outer limits of the Jur Garden. And they reinforce the idea that we are located just outside the garden, in the upper right, upper right corner, that is, of the bird's eye view, looking back into it, into a part of it that was too distant to be even visually summarized in the bird's eye view. Next. The pond that appears in leaf 13 is at the upper center of the bird's eye view, on the outer edge of the garden. Both the knoll in the lower right grown with vegetable-like stubby stalks, and the pavilion with terrace and railing at the back are partially visible in the bird's eye view. Next. For leaf 14, we move over into the left portion of the garden, where the principal residential buildings are located, and we look down into a courtyard with rocks and brightly blooming flowers under a canopy. Notice how skillfully the masses of flowers are fused into single areas, clearly readable as what they are, masses of flowers seen from a distance. What other painter in China or elsewhere before modern times had represented a flower garden in this way, instead of the simpler additive method of painting this flower, that flower, and putting them all together? Uh, behind the, the achievement, of course, lies that time in the Southern Shung, when artists had mastered the more visual way of painting that could represent an entire grove of trees, not tree by tree by tree, but as a visual unit. I talked about that when I showed, for instance, that superbly, um, the painting that superbly exemplifies this, that is the anonymous dream journey on the Xiaoshang, great 12th century work, which I had in one of the, uh, one of the lecture nines. Next. The host and guest appear once more inside the porch with the boy servant gazing out over an elaborate balustrade. The buildings and trees are probably the same that appear in the upper left of leaf 10. They are mostly concealed by trees in the bird's eye view. Now, as in the other leaves, we are given a privileged view behind and around the obstacles, permitted to penetrate the hidden parts of the garden in a series of small revelations. Next. The building seen in leaf 15, this one, is just to the left of these and appears to be the main audience hall, the great hall, which every garden must have, according to Ji Chung's treatise. The courtyard is now occupied, not by flowers and trellises, but by rocks and cypress trees. Next. And the two men, seated in the hall in earnest conversation, wear scholar officials' hats. From the areas of relaxation and pleasure-seeking, we have entered the sterner, sterner area of formal visits where the master of the garden receives fellow officials 
and exercises his status and power. Next. But this lasts only for a single leaf. In leaf 16, we move leftward again to look down into another courtyard with a rockery and servant women picking flowers. Next. A two-story pavilion opens onto this. Its upper floor, where an antique bronze appears on a table, shaded with a canopy propped out on poles. With more space, we can analyze how the oblique angle of view and the cut-off architectural elements uh, have the effect, among others, of imparting a sense of immediacy and veracity to the pictures. Next. If we now turn to look back, that is rightward in terms of the bird's eye view, as we are doing in this one, leaf 17, we are gazing down at an angle on the same large pavilion with two level terrace and railings overlooking the largest pond that was our vantage point for leaf five. That railing will look familiar. Uh, the trees around it are now blossoming, indicating a change of season. The smaller pond behind it was featured in leaf 10. You will remember that row of tall spindly trees with foliage beginning only high up from that earlier leaf. Next. Turning then to look downward without changing position, we will see in leaf 18, the left edge of the large pond in terms of the bird's eye view, and another V-shaped division with tall bamboo that almost repeats the composition of leaf three. A larger boat, a houseboat type, is moving across the pond with several occupants and boatmen. It may be that this leaf belongs further back. As I've said several times, more work needs to be done on this album to really figure it out completely. I don't claim at all that I myself have figured it out completely, although I'm presenting it as though I had. Next. Nearing the end of the tour, we encounter the only painting, Leaf 19, in which no visual materials appear that can be, can be clearly identified also in the other leaves. It must represent the rear gate of the garden behind the trees at the upper left of the bird's eye view. We are looking back now from outside the garden, and so we've returned to the world of practical affairs. And we see a fisherman beside his net raising apparatus, a boatman sculling his boat to transport a passenger with his luggage. The image is unclear, that's what it looks like. Next, please. The last leaf, leaf 20, is similarly a view from outside the garden this time from across the canal, to balance leaf two, the one we saw, which was about, about to enter the garden, that is. Now we have moved outside it. The central storied hall, or lo, with a master and guest seen for the last time in the open upstairs room, can just be discerned among the trees in the upper left of the bird's eye view. Appearing over the trees on the left side of this leaf is the pavilion with a two-storied porch that was featured in leaf 16, now seen from a different angle. The season is now winter, in accordance with an old convention, probably originating in 12 leaf months of the year albums, a convention of ending with a snow landscape. The little stand at the far left of the detail, a flat surface on a vertical support, is a stand for a potted plant, but the plants are taken inside for the winter, leaving this empty stand, which Zhang Hung faithfully includes because it's there. I remember Walter Hochstetter when I, he gave me this leaf and five others in return for things he wanted, explaining what this little thing was and explaining several other things he knew from having lived in China. Well, that we have in this leaf emerged from the ideal realm of the garden from which all commerce is banned is indicated again by a boatman in a grass raincoat and a hat pulling his loaded boat along the canal and by a flag protruding from a roof type at the bottom, indicating a wine shop or an inn. The longest inscription is on this leaf and includes the date, the dedication, and Zhang Hung's signature. Next, please. A great deal more could be written about the album as a work of art. And now that the mode of pictorial exposition is understood about the design of the garden, but your tour guide has run out of time and feels it's best to end here this very long lecture. Yours, James Cahill. Mm -hmm.